Hello. We're back with Midweek Musing. Uh, my wife Dale and I have been away for uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, much appreciated, much loved, much needed leave. But as we gear up towards Advent and towards Christmas and all that lies beyond for all of us, we come together, whoever, wherever we are, to worship God, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we find ourselves. And we pay our respects to their leaders, past, present and emerging, and commit ourselves, I pray, to that ongoing journey of reconciliation, a reconciliation that we know ultimately in Jesus Christ himself, our Lord and our Saviour. So let us worship God. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Bring your worship, all you peoples. God's love for us is a strong love. God's faithfulness is forever. In this musing, and indeed next week, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to unpack just a little bit, much as you can in two uh, Wednesday evenings, that core Christian belief in the place of community, for the body of Christ, the family of God, for God's people, for congregation, for community. You see, we were made to be in community. In fact, uh, the Christian faith for 2,000 years or thereabouts has had this understanding that God self is God in community. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer is God in relationship. So it's not surprising that when God creates the world and humankind is just one part of it, we are called to be in community, community with all creation, in community with all humankind, and ultimately with God's self. So community is central. We look at the early Christian church and that classic passage right at the end of Acts chapter 2. So we're exploring community the next two weeks. I speak to you as someone who has been deeply touched, formed, transformed, ultimately by Christ, God and Jesus Christ, but through Christian community. I think of the church I grew up in in Indrapilly. Baptised as a six-month-old, part of that community, initially in the Presbyterian Church and then come the formation of the Uniting Church in the Uniting Church. It was the church that Dale and I were married in almost 40 years ago, this coming December the 13th. It was a church that formed me in so many ways. It was a church, and I've shared this before with some of you, that had a commitment to being community, to developing relationships, to empowering and encouraging young people that sought to model inclusion, 
that was missional, that was evangelical, that took the scriptures seriously, that was prayerful, that was open to fresh uh, approaches in worship, in witness and in service. It was no wonder that I was part of a burgeoning young adults group uh, in the life of that church. I give thanks to God for that experience of Christian community. But over the years, more recently, I have been touched by and connected with some other Christian communities. I think of the Emmaus community, growing out of the Catholic Casillo movement. I've walked with Emmaus to Emmaus many times, been on team and been touched afresh each time by the incredible grace of God in Jesus Christ. I continue to be touched and connected with the Sojourners community, that evangelical social justice um, committed community founded decades ago by Jim Wallace uh, in Washington, D.C., a community that has spoken out uh, for decades, especially in recent times amid all the strife and division in the United States. I've been encouraged by the work, particularly the music, the contemplative way of the Taizé community, a community that continues to draw young people, especially from across the world, gathering together in northern France, and particularly through the work, the founding, the ministry, the contributions of the Iona community. I'm a friend of the Iona community. And uh, the rest of this musing, and certainly next week, I'm going to share how, um, the, how God, Father, Son and Spirit, has impacted me and millions around the world through this community. It's, you see, it's a community that was founded by the Reverend George MacLeod, a Presbyterian Church of Scotland minister uh, in the 1930s, in the aftermath of the Great Depression in Scotland, where he sought to find work for uh, ministers in training, for unemployed people. He had a passion for building the common life. You see, the word community comes from communitas, which means people. George MacLeod had a passion and a yearning for developing community. And as a means of doing that, they went to the island of Iona, this remote Hebridean island off the west coast of Scotland, about three hours north of Glasgow. And there they began the long task of rebuilding a much derelict Benedictine Abbey. That work took several decades. I don't think it was until about 1960 that the Abbey was so rebuilt that worship could resume there. Um, the common life could be explored, not just explored, but lived. What does it mean to be community in Christ? I have been privileged and humbled to connect for three separate weeks over the last 15 years with the Iona community on Iona. I'll share some of that experience. Uh, Dale's been able to be part of that too. During this, during today's musing, we're going to connect with prayer and style of worship and songs that come out of the Iona community. We're actually going to use um, today um, their morning prayer service as offered from the Iona community, though we're way on the other side of the world. We will use some of their music. 
which in some way, shape or form has been either written or encouraged or, or brought to the wider world by uh, the renowned John Bell, Church of Scotland minister, prolific hymn writer, one of my musical heroes, who I've been happy and privileged to have, have sat under countless times over the years. He's been a frequent visitor to Australia. Let us worship God. If you wish, I invite you to respond with the words in bold font before you. The world belongs to God, the earth and all its people. How good it is, how wonderful to live together in unity. Love and faith come together, justice and peace join hands. If Christ's disciples kept keep silent, these stones would shout aloud. Open our lips, O God, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Move among us, God, give us life. Let your people rejoice in you. Give us again the joy of your help. With your spirit of freedom, sustain us. God, make us our hearts clean. Restore us in body, mind and spirit. Let us pray. We come to God with a, in a time of confession. And imagine praying this prayer in community, with people around us, opposite us, beside us. We can't do that unless we have a, a partner in the location that we're engaging with this music from. But imagine others sharing in this musing at exactly this time. So we have an opportunity to offer forgiveness to others as they offer God's forgiveness to us. Trusting in God's forgiveness, let us in silence confess our failings and acknowledge our part in the pain of the world. Before God, with the people of God, I confess to turning away from God in the ways I wound my life, the life of others and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to turning away from God in the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Our Bible reading is that wonderful reading about community in the very earliest days of the Christian church. Reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, from verse 43. This may well be very familiar to you. This is following on from the day of Pentecost. Everyone was amazed by the many miracles and wonders that the apostles worked. And all the Lord's followers often met together and they shared everything they had. They would sell their property and possessions and give the money to whoever needed it. Day after day they met together in the people, in the day after day they met together in the temple. They broke bread together in different homes and shared their food happily and freely while praising God. Everyone liked them, and each day the Lord added to their group others who were being saved. For the word of God in Scripture. For the word of God among us. For the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. I don't plan to make this musing a history lesson, though I know some of you, like me, just love history. 
will be aware that the Celts have been, as best we can tell, in existence for many years, perhaps in Europe even before the time of Christ. Um, particularly in Central Europe, we believe around uh, Austria perhaps, and then extending into Spain and Turkey, and then eventually into Northern Europe, and then into the British Isles. We believe by the time Jesus was born, so the Celts have been around a long time, but there was no semblance of them being um, connected with the Christian faith. In fact, their practices were very pagan. Reading from some material that says the Celts, before the coming of Christianity, believed that the, the divine pervaded every aspect of life and that spirits were everywhere. In ancient trees and sacred groves, mountain tops and rocks formations, rivers and streams and holy wells. The earth was regarded as the source of all fertility and the great forces of nature, moon, ocean, sun and wind, were worshipped as manifestations of the divine. Now, we need to fast forward a bit. By about the 5th, 6th, 7th century, things had changed. And there was a move away to the understanding of faith and religion and church and community modelled by the Roman church, which, quoting, tended to be authoritarian, hierarchical, male-dominated, rational and strongly legalistic. In co contrast, the Celtic Church celebrated grace and nature as good gifts from God, recognised the sacredness of all creation, had a love of mysticism and poetry, and included women in its leadership. Another important aspect within the development of Christianity in the fringes of Britain and Ireland was that of isolation. Following the example of the Desert Fathers of the East, the early Christian leaders sought isolation in the wild and desolate places, away from what they saw as the encroachment of the world upon their faith. They wanted to centre their thoughts and their lives totally upon God, to be as close as was spiritually possible to the Creator. And out of that burgeoning expression of self, of Celtic spirit, Christian spirituality, people like St. Patrick, St. Columba came to the fore. And over a period of centuries, uh, historians have tracked the missionary movement. Hear that? The missionary movement of Celtic Christianity almost in a reverse direction from uh, Ireland and um, Northern Britain down back into mainland uh, Europe and beyond. There's so much that I could share generally about Celtic uh, Christian uh, spirituality. But many writers point out these important points. There was a genuine love of nature and a passion for God's creation, coupled with a sense of closeness between the natural and the supernatural. There was no distinction between the sacred and the secular. All was in some way, shape or form the embodiment of God's creation, no matter how flawed and fractured it might be. Iona, and you've got to be there to experience it, is understood as being a thin place, a place where heaven and earth come close. Believe me, it is tangible. It is tangible. As I said before, Celtic Christian spirituality encourages a love of art and poetry. There's a distinct emphasis in Celtic Christian spirituality on the Trinity, on the incarnation of Christ. In fact, being an incarnational uh, people, embodying, being the hands, feet, 
heart, mind and voice of Christ. Within their religious life, we see an emphasis on solitude, on pilgrimage, on mission, on sacred locations and important times of confession. An emphasis on family, on kinship ties. As I've already said, a greater sense of equality for women way back then. And Dale and I have experienced this for sure. A generous hospitality was part of their everyday life. The common life. Next week, I'd like to share with you some deep moments from the trip that Dale and I took to Iona just over five years ago. I took some study leave in exploring, exploring uh, some aspects of worship. Um, so more about that uh, next week. We continue to worship God. The Iona community, in more specific ways, can trace uh, its origins to the arrival on the island of Iona by Columba. And I think it's about 563 or 653. It doesn't matter, around about the 6th, 7th century, in a boat called a Coracle. He came from Ireland. I've actually stood on the beach, a very rocky beach, where it's believed Columba and his small party uh, arrived. More about that next week. We spend some time now offering our prayers of gratitude and concern to God. As some quiet music plays, I invite you to bring your prayers of thanksgiving, of gratitude, but also of concern to God, knowing that God in Jesus Christ takes our prayers and lifts them to God's self, and that God is God of compassion, hope, peace, grace, and promise. Let's come to God in prayer. Come bring your burdens to God. Come bring your burdens, come bring your burdens to God. Come bring your burdens to God. For Jesus will never sin. Jesus will never sin. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We will not offer to God offerings that cost us nothing. Go in peace to love and to serve. We will seek peace and pursue it in the name of the Trinity of love. God in community, holy and one. Amen. Friends, I'm glad that we can join together again after a bit of a break for this week's musing. A look at community through the Celtic Christian spirituality lens, particularly through that of the Iona community. We'll delve more deeply into the Iona community not for the Iona community's sake, but ultimately so that we can connect with God. And through our connection with God, be a missional people in God's world. God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his likeness upon you and grant you God's peace. Amen. Over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head, I hear music in the air. Over my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. Over my head, I hear music.
music in the air, over my head. I hear music in the air.